Good afternoon, my name is Jan Kavan and I will be talking today about composing adaptive music theory and praxis. Before we start, I would like to say a couple words about myself. Uh, I'm a composer by trade. I graduated the Anarchics Academy of Music and Performing Arts, uh, both as master degree and uh, later on PhD. And already when I was doing PhD, I was focused on interactive music systems. Since 2004, I am a teacher of music composition, electroacoustic music and multimedia composition there. And since 2018, I'm also a teacher of interactive electronics and interactive music at Brno University of Technology. Uh, I'm also a cellist and performer, uh, namely I'm founding member of Ensemble Marian. I recorded CDs with Metamorphosis, Rev General, Teoria Otrasu and so on. But also, I am active in game industry since 2001. I participated in more than 15 published games in various roles by different studios. And in 2006, I started my own independent game development studio called CB Software. And I'm telling you all that because I'm very passionate about this subject. I'm very passionate about adaptive music. And usually when I teach this, I need uh, two semesters just to explain basic. Now I have 15 minutes. So it will be a bit telegraphic, I apologize for that, and I won't be uh, able to make any live examples or any, any uh, samples of that, because there simply is not time. So, before we start talking about adaptive music, let's focus on linear and nonlinear music. Uh, my definition is that linear music unfolds along a fixed timeline with defined formal parts that are connected always in the same way, which means that you have like a timeline, which starts at point A, ends at point B, and you basically go through this timeline. And it has a big advantage. For example, you have a very good control over the time spent. You have a, you can build emotional peaks. You can. Uh, very well work with proportions, you can very well, well work with form. Example of such a linear music is, for example, uh, Symphony No. 5, C minor, by Ludwig van Beethoven, who uh, composed a linear music. Uh, let's think about nonlinear music, which basically consists of some sort of loose parts that can, but doesn't necessarily need to, happen in the composition based upon variables other than the time itself. Uh, so uh, these variable, variables can be, for example, a uh, will of the interpret, it can be some external parameters, something. And it can have many shapes, uh, being it matrices, trees, fractals, particles. So basically, the music can stem in different direction than just a line which goes from A to B. Uh, example of such part can be John Cage's Variations number 1 from 1958, where you can basically choose which parts you will play in what order and if. And if we think about adaptive music, and that's why I define the nonlinear music, uh, we say that it's a special case of nonlinear music where the form and overall shape is defined let's say, adapting to external inputs. Typically, we can encounter adaptive music at various interactive installations, and even more typically, these days, we hear adaptive music in video games. So, if we think about what can be adapting uh, infrastructure, we can have various motion tracking devices, sensors, light, humidity, temperature, some data inputs, for example, RSS feeds from internet, or chats, some news, uh, you can search the news for some things like disaster, this is very modern these days, or input peripherals like mouse, keyboard, gamepad, AI recognition classification, so you can have some camera which is basically parsing some, some inputs and classifies them and uses them for an adapting uh, the music to, to these inputs. And that all and much more can be used to provide this necessary data for adaptive music. Uh, when we start with idea of adaptive music, first of all, we need to define some sort of finite state space where this adaptive music will exist. Because unlike this linear music where we have this control, we can start here, we can end here, we can make this form, the adaptive music is basically not that, it's adapting to what's going on, what's happening. So it's much more complex. 
Uh, my advice, of course, is to start with the top-down dramaturgy. So basically, you start with um, with an overview, with some sort of what the space for the music is, how we can define it. And uh, we have to think differently. We have to start by defining the borders where the adaptive music exists and where it does not. And uh, my advice, again, is to focus on transition types on some sort of meta level. So basically define them in a different words than just let's transition from part A to part B. That's, we have to find some or we should find some names for that. So my advice, again, is to use a nature language to define these borders and to, to uh, use these borders to understand what our music is doing. Because as soon as it starts adapting, it's very hard to backtrack it. It's very hard to understand if it's doing the right thing or not, if we don't have the proper way how we can recognize that. And one of the possible ways is using a meaning-driven composition approach. So basically assign meanings to individual parts, individual structures, individual layers, individual objects, and go with that. I would like to make an example because when in 2013 I invented my mood composer, which was a, which was a, a low-level composition system. I used it in our game Julia Among the Stars. I used uh, hierarchical finite state machines, which basically uh, were the way how you can transition from one mood to another just by saying, okay, I need it to be sad or I need, to, I need the music to be happy or depressed or scared. And the problem which I very early on uh, ran into was that the states are discrete. Uh, and let me just illustrate this problem to you. Uh, basically, this is a very simplified example just to put the meaning across. So we have like a negative hierarchy and positive hierarchy. This is like a top level. And then we have like a sub substates, which can be sad, scared, depressed. And you can say they can basically transition here. And uh, then you transition positive and you can be curious, you can be happy, you can be achieving. And all of these arrows means that there are some built-in algorithmic transitions how you can basically go from negative to positive without uh, breaks, without some sort of uh, cuts, how, how to make it fluently. But the problem, which I uh, posed here, I called it the mood problem, is that when you define the mood, it's basically some sort of ratio. So you are sort of scared, a lot of scared, then you are also depressed and but you can also be curious at the same time so it's like a ratio it's not this kind of discrete jump from one state to another which was the original design of uh, this kind of uh, finite state machine i uh, started with so i would like to talk about decomposing adaptive music which is the important part because when you compose for film when you compose for theater you basically have usually some fixed scenes, you have some fixed time where you just, you know, can create a very nice uh, bows, you can create very nice uh, emotions, you can create some feelings there. But as soon as you are doing adaptive music, uh, it's all gone. And you have no idea if this will be there for 10 minutes or 5 minutes and the music can't have this kind of natural formal or structural properties you are used to as a traditional composer. So um, let's just think about what we can do. First of all, uh, we should consider composing music more atomically, which means not using a long uh, structure. Also, this adaptive music should be transition aware because you should always be able to transition from one part to another part based upon external input. So you are not in charge as a composer. You no longer have this power to, to influence the emotions to, because there is somebody who is putting in the variables. So somebody is parameterizing your music and changing it. And uh, there are three ways how you can basically do that. The first is like a fully procedural. So you basically all the parameters of the music, which means pitches, uh, note lengths, everything, you know, dynamics, everything 
just this procedure is just generated. Or you just take some of the parameters, or you can take the another approach, which means resequencing. And resequencing means that uh, you basically have a prepared part of music and you combine them together as if you have been a sequencer, but, but based upon the parameters. Another way how you can think about that is to uh, structure music into layers, which is basically something which you can layer on top of each other, up or down, just decomposed music into some, 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 some uh, horizontal parts. You can use structures and you can use musical objects, which means some very small musical ideas or, or musical objects, which you can basically generate. And there you can do a lot of good math, you can do statistics, uh, how you generate it, and this is the way how you can make nice transitions, and I will be talking about this a little bit later. Also, you have to decide if your music needs to be tempo-aware or tempo-unaware, uh, which means if you create some beautiful beat uh, with some melody, and there is a transition, you need to synchronize it, you need to transition with the proper harmony, with the proper with a proper beat. Or you can go in a different uh, direction and you can think about density. So basically you can decide how dense the musical objects are or processuality, which means that you can, for example, build upon existing uh, structures and have some sort of data which, sell, uh, which tells you how you can combine them, how you can, for example, create a complex structure out of five different. It's a bit similar if you have like a molecule in chemistry, you can build it from atoms. And here you can think that your musical objects are atoms and you can define rules how you can build your molecules, which atoms can go where, and you can again use the parameters to drive this in. And the last part in my super condensed talk is introduction to basic transitions. So I always talk, I already talk about layering, uh, which means that you have uh, some layers and you can stack them on top of each other, creating more dense music or less dense music. And this is something which you can, for example, use if you for imagine you have some kind of space where you want to make the, the recipient more scared. So you can add more scary layers to it or you can just detract them. So it's very easy to do. Uh, you can create a sound object generation ratio, so you can, for example, add to it some kind of sound objects and you can decide how many of them and you can also make a nice transitions because you can change uh, from one kind of mood to another kind of mood or meaning to another kind of meaning and as you change the ratio, it kind of organically transition from one to another. You can create harmonic wire leaps, so basically uh, you, if you want to make a harmonic music or, and which is basically even uh, uh, rhythm based, what you can do is basically create a continuation or transition tracks where you say, okay, now I am on, uh, in, in uh, F-sharp major, so I want to uh, use this kind of transition track to go to another track and then you need to build a matrix of, of these kind of transitions. You can also use uh, covered cuts, uh, which means that if you have a, like a very distant uh, sound words and it's very hard to connect them, you can use, for example, something with a lot of noise or something which is basically uh, uh, very loud and you can cover it. You can usually see this using a symbol or something like that. But uh, yeah, you can create anything uh, which would just basically connect the two words, hide the cut. And of course, there's another way that you can use affecting, you can use uh, processing, like, uh, and uh, it also can add, uh, add another dimension, uh, different filters, uh, low pass filters, bad pass filters, uh, different, uh, for example, granular synthesis, you can do a lot of stuff with, uh, with affecting, which can again be parameter driven and can again create the meanings you want. And you can, of course, destroy the sound, you can construct the sound, which is very important, very interesting way how to look at it, not only by this kind of typical composer's view, but if you know and if you find the ways how this to destroy your sound and build it back, it can be very powerful meaning-wise. So, that's it for my super condensed talk. I would love to thank you all for listening to me, and I'm ready if you have any questions for me. Thank you very much.